Chances are, is intended for mature, open-minded audiences only. If you are easily offended, we suggest you turn this wacky shit straight off. <laughs> it's 106 degrees outside, and my AC decided to crap out about 10 no! minutes ago. And that mercury, oh, wow. So 10 minutes ago, it was about 71 degrees in here, which is warmer than I usually keep it. Then I Hello? noticed, like, wait a minute, why is it not Gary? getting cool? <laughs> yeah, oh, Gary. Uh, and then I finally realized, yeah, the, the refrigeration part was not kicking in. I'm like, oh, no, 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 not today, not today. And it got hot fast. So it's about 82 in here right now. But right before logging on, I, uh, I turned it back on, hoping that it would just kick in. And it did. It's struggling, but I'll take it. <laughs> and already the mercury is falling, so... Oh, dog, a hundred and, and it's getting a little cooler outside. It's one Oh three right now, but it was one Oh seven about an hour ago. So my poor little ACs are struggling. <laughs> Gary, <laughs> what's wrong with Gary's phone? Hello, Gary. Uh, I don't know why I find that so st stupid, funny. John Mark's referring to a thing we've been doing for the comet called the comet answering <laughs> machine. It's actually kind of based on what I tried to get going on uh, the podcast in terms of feedback, which is people sending their, you know, in lieu of having a proper voicemail box set up for uh, listeners to call into, just re recording their messages and sending them to us, and then I would put them all together. Uh, and, but this one's more locally centric, and it's kind of like open mic meets uh, letters to the editor, if you will. And it's <laughs> tomorrow will be the third one, but I love where it's headed. But I, to fill it out and to just, you know, play along myself, I've been do playing this old man character. Like, he doesn't know how to answer. Uh, doesn't know how an answering machine works. He's just like Gary. Hello. I don't know. Maybe his phone's busted. I've got a whole trilogy worked out. It'll culminate tomorrow. But then he'll be. Uh, he's gonna figure out that oh, you got one of those answering services. I don't know if it's funny for anybody else but me, but it makes me laugh every time I hear it back. So. Yeah. Spoilers. You know what it reminds me of? Oh yeah. What? It reminds me of uh like uh old the uh, some of the negative land stuff from back in the day when they did radio shows and shit. Mm. Ah, yeah. Good shit. Um it's kinda got a few things going for it and I really hope it takes off. I do put everything under like a filter to make it sort of sound tinny, like an old timey cassette tape answering machine. Which <laughs> they are considered old timey at this point. Anywho, for tonight's program, um, I don't know about y'all, but I'm kind of tired of talking about politics and all the stuff and the viruses and everything. I wanted to get back to doing something more along the lines of what we usually would do. And tonight, not that it's going to be necessarily more lighthearted, although some of these are just. You'll be enjoying them, shall we say, in an interesting way. I'm going to be talking about tales, true tales of revenge and vengeance. Some of them mm -hmm. are pretty uh, pretty creepy, a little worrisome, and some of them are just like, oh, hell yeah. We can't believe something right. so satisfying and delicious ever actually happened. But uh, I mostly verified these, so <laughs> I don't want to go right. too far down that verification road. And then Christopher F. Hart has uh, one of his little games, not uh, weird trivia tonight, but uh, some, one of his other guessing game type situ situ mm -hmm. situ Wow, I almost married scenario and situation, which I guess would have been situario. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Situario? Yeah. Which I played it's on a the new game. game I, it's a new <laughs> game I made up called uh, Guess How Many Fingers Were On. Uh, three. <laughs> oh, there's two. Um, but before we do any of that, anything, uh, the, the stage is yours, as they say. Any news, any world uh, events you want to toss in, it's fine by me. Could we do a shameless plug to our little uh, companion video mm -hmm. we've uh, been working on here? Absolutely. We have talked about doing this for a long time now, but we finally got together. Uh, no, I reached out to Christopher. God, I feel like it was a year ago. Couldn't have been that long. <laughs> but it was a while ago because I started doing these videos really right before the shutdown. As soon as I lost Radar Station, I tried to get more video presence going online. Then all my computers crashed. So we uh, put this on the back burner. But now that I've got uh, a better setup, we decided to try it again. What I wanted to do was like a weekly show with Christopher, specifically like a mini encapsulated version of 
news quiz, and I basically left him to his own devices on how it would work. And I think what you came up with was great, and, and everyone seems to agree that it works. And uh, so basically it's like 15 or 20 minutes. We're going to aim for 15 or 20 minutes a week where uh, Christopher brings us a story and you managed to put it into uh, a quiz. It was just one story, but you did give me a little mm-hmm. quiz on it. And uh, yeah, so I think it hit all the notes. I thought it was fun. Uh, I realized, you remember when we first started podcasting? I don't know about you guys. I, th- I, I think we had a conversation about this, but I, it took me quite a while to adjust to uh, hearing my own voice. Yeah. I, it, it's very weird. And I, I'm, having the, <laughs> I'm having the same problem, seeing my own face. <laughs> yeah. And I... Uh, I realized how much I use my hands to speak. It's, mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot going on there. Yeah, I do too. Um, it was actually the first time we did. No, no, it was the first time I had somebody in the studio as a guest on the podcast, and they pointed out how much I'm, my arms are usually flailing about. But mm-hmm. the the video thing is different. I mean, it's like learning your. Uh, <laughs> you know, we all have ticks, and we notice our own ticks. I think more than other people do or things that just like oh why'd i do that or why am i making that face or uh, it it <laughs> yeah you, you guys drive yourself crazy look fine you guys look just so you know you guys look fine to me i didn't i mean it's it's the same thing like i think like you were saying is like when you hear your own voice it's weird but just when you see yourself it's weird too but everybody else yeah. it's like oh that's them being what yeah how well, they are you well, know only so, fine so don't worry about it <laughs> word word yeah, yeah Chris, no i thought you, it was uh, it was fun oh, sorry did, go ahead you, did you notice your uh twilighter uh, I can't not notice it. Well, I style it every fucking day. Okay. Yeah, no, I you're, haven't you're had You're a handsome man a on okay. camera. Everyone agrees. Sure. Oh, got a good, uh, got, got, got a good presence. Your teeth look impeccable. Your hair, uh, Sarah was commenting on your beard looking illustrious. It's oh, all very impressive yeah. on camera. So yeah, you know, it's going. It's one camera. of the most magnificent beards I think it, I know. It truly is, but it, it does so look beard. especially majestic on camera. It's interesting. Huh. I don't know. I'll take it. Yeah. I'll take it. But anyway, it. we we don't really have a set schedule. We don't really have a set day. I'd rather not pigeonhole it. I, I would just like to be able to do it when we can do it and um, follow. You know, if you're following us on, on Facebook, you'll see it. Uh, and you can also follow the Comet Magazine on Facebook because it is something that I I sort of forced into the comet world because i do a how bizarre column every month in the comet magazine well now that i'm not printing at the moment it's all going on the website but uh so there will be actually that's a good idea i should archive all of these on the website so you can just find them all in one click and uh marathon them binge them as they say little bite-sized doses yeah, of sure. reality that you may or may not wish to have heard just binge me and Ron. <laughs> Binges. Or, or orally and uh, visually. Binges, mm-hmm. bitches. <laughs> That's a good slogan for something, right? Binges, Binges bitches. bitches. <laughs> Anywho, uh, anyone got anything they want to bring up for a soup a dash hour? I got some cool stories. Nope. Oh. Yeah, John Mark's I want to give rough. John Mark a Yeah, I want to yeah, give we, him a hug. We need to give him some hugs. Job, he lost uh, one of his puppers, which we're uh, very sad to hear. That's never easy easy to go through yeah he lived a good long life though and it sounds like you gave him uh, everything a dog could have ever wanted in his old years well that was the goal is to make sure that he was ulti- as happy as he could be you know during his twilight age and i think we accomplished that task so you definitely did and that's all dogs care about they don't they don't care they, they don't understand years <laughs> right like they if if your dog dies at four versus 17 or whatever um that's all stuff that we have to deal with you know it's like stuff we have to process but animals are so much better at just going and all they want is love and fun and they just want to be your buddy while they're here and if you can do that that's all you can do and then when it's time to let them go you just got to let them go rip your fucking heart out but you know they had their fun they had their love uh, every puppy should uh, be so lucky to die that happy and that loved especially because you adopted him in his later years right you, you just got him yeah a couple he years was ago. he was uh we, they said he they thought he was about 10 and a half so he'd be about he's about about 15 or so now yeah that's an awesome thing to do that's not a 
popular or common thing to do for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, you want to invest a, in a dog, and you, a lot of times you want it to be a family dog and be there for most of the kids' life inside the house. And a lot of times they are. You know, they are there that long. But there are so many great senior dogs that still have, uh, even if it's only one or two good years left, it's awesome to think about those doggies getting good homes too and something to think about for any of you uh, out there uh, john mark can attest i'm sure that y- you had great times with that old dog and you know yeah no he was he was super great like and he he was like one of the one of the easiest dogs i've ever i've ever lived with like he there was really like he he didn't chew anything he didn't destroy anything he didn't get into the garbage he didn't have any accidents inside you know what i mean it was just like amazing how easy he was so it was just a really a a pleasure to have that dog in our life well why don't we do this why don't we uh tell everybody that this week uh, between now and the next episode anyone that wants to donate money to the paypal.me slash the comment mag account We'll just donate 100% of that to the Humane Society. In uh, your old, remind me of the pupper's name, Chance. Yeah, Chance. Yep. And then we actually get, we actually did get him from the Humane Society in Wenatchee. So. Oh, perfect. So uh, how about that? PayPal.me/slash the Comet Mag, and uh, just p- put whatever you want to put in there. 100% of it this week will go to uh, the Humane Society. With love from Chance. Uh, nice little tribute and. Sorry, man. It it never it never doesn't suck a lot. Yeah, to lose a pet, no matter how long you've been with them. Uh, Lyle, you said you had some stories you wanted to uh, bring up. Yeah, we got a little bit of space. We got a little bit of Egypt, and we got a little bit of uh, <laughs> uh, something else special. Well, I'll say that one. For oh, a lot. okay. <laughs> God, I'm damn. already intrigued. I know, right? Uh, you guys all noticed that the the launch um, went off today, right? I didn't. I didn't see it. I didn't see any right. news today. What, what launch? I what have on? no idea. To Mars? Uh, ooh. What? Yeah, Perseverance. Okay, I was making sure. It's still July 30th. So It, it still is. <laughs> well, yeah. it's still Fuck. July 30th. And that's Fuck. It came out. So I'm just double-checking facts real quick because I didn't know if it yeah. maybe it was an older story. Yeah. But uh, NASA? Grapnel, they just sh- shot... Huh? Who are we talking about? Is it NASA or is it SpaceX? It's is NASA. It, it was uh, the rover, uh, Perseverance. Oh. Hmm. Launched it off to go to Mars to pick up uh, soil samples and stuff from the other rover and to bring it back. That's pretty cool. cool. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, they'll be able to oh. distinctly know for 100% sure if there was any life on Mars. And oh, uh, miss this. the touchdown uh, on Mars will be uh, February of next year. They described parts of it like uh, they were going to team up with the other rover up there to gather uh, physical um, stuff to bring back, to wow. analyze it here on Earth. That's so amazing. there will be parts here on Earth. It will land in the crater, the Jezero crater, in about seven months. I've landed in that crater wow. a few times in the world. Did we? <laughs> did we, did we, we must have got faster going to Mars, right? Or is it just, I guess these things... It's a chip. Why did it's I not, think it was a two-year no. trip to uh, to get something? But it's long. Person? It's long ways. It's just they could go a lot faster than they can with humans on. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I suppose you're right. You wouldn't have to worry about G. Yeah, I thought it was like three years to get there or some shit. Well, I think Lyle's right. I think it, it must be that uh, they don't have to worry about you know <laughs> the effect of those kinds of speeds or flying through. You know, if you destroy this thing, it would be sad, but you wouldn't be killing, you know, 15 pioneers going to, to Mars if a space rock went flying through you. Yeah, it's got cameras on it, too. It's got an array of, like, 23 cameras. It'll be taking its own data also with the newer technology. Let me tell you, boys, 2020 sucks ass, but the cameras in 2020 are freaking phenomenal. Canon is coming out with a... A DSLR, mirrorless, well, it's not DSLR, it's a mirrorless camera that shoots 8K. That's fucking insane. That's like an Aria Lexus. Mm. Uh, Sony just came out with one that's just, it, the specs almost double it. And it's just just insane. These things, they could literally almost fit in your coat pocket. Wow. I mean, camera's technology now is like just amazing. Oh. And, but unfortunately, it <laughs> comes with the price. They're about like $4,000 cameras. Wow. They're consumer professional cameras, but they're still really expensive. 
fun. Do you, so think, he, that camera, do you think that camera purchases have gone way down in the last 10 years because of cell phones? Yes. I would, I would yeah, think so, okay. like, on the, on the consumer level, but on the prosumer level, I feel like I see more or as many DSLR cameras around that I ever did, and I notice it because it surprises me. But well, DSLRs are extinct. Or whatever they, the fuck. The last, year, last year was last year DSLRs. What are they, they called now? Not, what are the? They're going to be mirrorless like cameras. They're not going to do the, the the whole mirror in the camera anymore. Mirrorless. Yep, mm. it's been mirrorless like for probably zone, five right. years. And uh, Canon was the last one to get on that bandwagon, but now they they're frontlining it, which is nice. But like Sony's kicking ass too, so yeah. Interesting. But yeah. Well, you, Cell phones, uh, if you're talking about specs and you really dive into the specs and stuff, the, knife, the iPhone 11 is fucking phenomenal. People film short films with those, mm-hmm. and it's you can't tell the difference. You really can't. It's The high dynamic range and everything is really, really good. Our phones are so all-encompassing. Like a camera seems so unitask, right? <laughs> like, like, like you can just, you're like, can I watch Netflix on it? <laughs> it seems odd that we still have technology that, really just kind of does the one thing. Although most of them are film cameras and yeah, not film in terms they're, of like film, but like typ- video capability. Right. They're, they're typically, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're not film, they're digital. But we can move on to uh, Egypt. They found these uh, two sarcophaguses that were over 3,000 years old, right? <laughs> he said that like Christopher Wacken. I know. Yeah, or maybe, maybe it was more like... Uh, <laughs> Well, anyway, <laughs> like how I do I say garages? Sarcophagus. Sarcophagus. <laughs> Garages. 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 Yeah, I, I had dialysis today, so I feel like cut her ass. Yeah, uh, but like uh, anyway, they found uh, these in a museum. They were just you know kind of like X Files, they stuffed away, you know. But there were three thousand year old little sarcophagi. You know, they were mm. they weren't that big, so they assumed they they assumed that they were uh, like children. You mm-hmm. know. And found out that they weren't even fucking human. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Intrigue. Intrigue. <laughs> Intrigue. Mm-hmm. How bizarre. Mm-hmm. How do we know this? So, well, they couldn't open it because, you know, obviously something like that, you open and it'll just turn to dust. It'll be like, <laughs> like old man Evans when <laughs> you try to open uh, that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 yeah. Most <laughs> troubling Come sound of all time. Oh, man, Ron Evans. That's 8 p.m., Ron Evans. Hey, hey, what time is it? <laughs> I'm missing the new Jeopardy. <laughs> so one of them actually resembled uh, an Oris, uh, Oris, you know, the, the god, Oris, Oris. Uh, which is, is a bird-like creature. It didn't, you know, have bird-like features on the sarcophagus. It just had, like, his eyes, the golden eyes and, and whatnot, uh, basically, you know, a signature of that particular god so they put it in a ct scan right and it happened to come out uh after you know three thousand years and all this like you know it's kind of like what's in the vault of uh um when giraldo you know right. in the yeah so they uh they run it through the machine and it turns out it was a, it's a falcon there's an ancient falcon that's been mummified and buried with the king hmm. and in the second in the second sarcophagus was his food was his that kind of, was his there, food? Yeah, with for the uh, for the uh, was, bird was bird food. Yeah, for the afterlife. I'm looking at these right now. Um, huh. So did they X-ray? Is did they just X-ray them? That's how they know what's inside. It was a CT scan. There's a video for oh, it. Yeah, yeah shows a video of it. There's hmm. a CT scan. It splits everything up, and inside it looks like a, it looks like a pretty sick turkey, but it's. it's <laughs> I saw sick turkey open for Ween a couple of times, I think. Uh, rest in peace. I didn't make it on that last plane flight, but uh, interesting. Well, yeah, not terribly surprising, yeah. but I haven't heard of... I mean, we know that they loved cats. And they, you know, they eat... I know a few things. They, I know they mummified cattle. They, they did have, like, uh, oxen and stuff they mummified. Mm. I, I've never heard of falcon. Yeah. Other things like cats. I've heard of that. Yeah, they love their cats. Yeah. But I'm wondering what it was. Well, I wonder if the falcon was like the like the pharaoh's pet. Yeah. You, know? you can kind of picture it, can't you? Like just flying yeah. up, on, up on the palace, flying over all the slaves and all the common folk down there, landing on his arm. <laughs> He's like, yeah, that's right. I'm the fucking pharaoh. 
<laughs> Command oh, Cox. Do you have a Falcon? Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I oh, bet you Falcon don't. <laughs> Falcon A, right? <laughs> Falcon A. <laughs> uh, interesting. Yeah. All right, but for my final story, this is a good one. This is the best one. Our beloved all time world champion of boxing, Mike Tyson, is making a comeback. I heard I this. saw that, and he, he looks pretty that? good for what, 52 or something like that? Uh, yeah. he's, he's, a, he's a bad man. I would not want to fuck with that man. No. He's a bad man. That and, guy will uh, die so, having a fist that w- that could kill you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Even, he wasn't even trying, he'd probably kill him. I mean, mm-hmm. he was so scary in his prime, like that, like scary, in all legendary. Ways. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. He's oh, fifty four. I, I hear he's kind of a sweetheart now, though. Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't think he's that. Aggressive. Am I wrong? Am I, have, I, have I been misled? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, did, I, I think I think all different. along he had that element. You, you know, he was like, no, yeah. I, I think you're right, Chris. I think he's he's a total. He, he's totally chill. He has his own like pot company now. Like he's just. <laughs> she <you know>. exerts. <laughs> Everything cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just sit back and chill. But, but yeah, he yeah no. But he is like he has the scariest fists of, of all time. I think. I mean, he's yeah, probably the greatest. I think our generation was kind of intimidated and almost like brainwashed that he was a badass because we used to play that uh, Mike Tyson's punch up. Remember ass. they had to take his name off of it after <laughs> after all the allegations about him being like, I think a beaten, spousal abuser. Yeah, yeah. beating uh, Robin Givens, I think it was. Oh, yeah. Who I just came across so a Playboy became... with her in my studio. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, she I talked bet about. you just came across one. Twice. <laughs> I was like, where is it? Where is it? No, I just happened to stumble Oops. upon this after six and a half hours. I'm going to be giving me some Robins, if you know I, I came across it. No, I almost came across it. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, uh, there was a video not that long ago going around of him just kind of doing the moves. You know, the so rope a dope kind of moves. And it's like, whew, yeah, he's, he's still got it. Oh, yeah. Uh, Chris, you might want to pause this or uh, maybe use the time for a bathroom break. Rajo. <laughs> uh, so, Going next. So, so Mike Tyson, he decides that, you know, being Mike Tyson, what the, because he's got a little bit, if you read into the article, he's got a little bit of fucking ring fright. Not a, he's not scared to get back in the ring, but he's got a little bit of undertaking, you know, because he knows he's old. You know, he's, yeah. he's past his prime. So what he decides to do, and he's gonna, this is going to air on TV. And August uh, 9th, so it's next month. It's like in a couple weeks. He's going to go into a fucking shark tank and rumble in the reefs and, and fight a shark. What? Apparently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not even kidding. All right. What, 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 what's Peter got to say about that? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, in, it's in the ocean, man. You got uh, the, the maritime law. Gonna... Oh, you can't fuck around with that. <laughs> Are they both going to wear gloves? Maritime law. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, some striped angelfish will be the referee. Yeah, um, what is that? That can't be real. How can I you? Think, I, I think it's going to be a man able fight, fight a shark. I don't. I don't think it's it's actually physically going to do. that. I think oh, he's going to go in a cage. Don't he's you just punch in the nose? I saw Tomb Raider. Is how it works. Right? You just you, poof, no. You just punch a shark in the nose, you, and it. Mike Tyson him. is set to fight a great That's, white shark. Is there the what extraordinary are the matchup like, pits the baddest man on planet against the most? It, it's no. that's part this, this of the joke. It has to be yeah. a joke, but what? But how, ultimately, how does that play out? <laughs> it plays out with him. Where's this article coming from? Is it on the Onion? Well, this one—it's no, it's all over the place. Um, Discovery, Independent, um, CNN, Golf Digest. It's—it's <laughs> it's making news. The question is, even the, the even the pictures look like a joke, like. Well, I'm sure. I, what, what it's probably going to be is going to he's going to go into a cage, <laughs> and with be there with the shark, and maybe do like some fake punches, or maybe do a little boxing underwater. I'd watch it. That's a bad it, idea a too. Uh, I watch it. I'd pay five dollars to watch that. What are you doing right now, Mike Tyson? <laughs> <laughs> he's getting Get out of there. Well, I guess we'll see. My my gut tells me that it'll probably be a CGI thing. Maybe. But every, all, all the headlines are saying, I'd watch it. Is I, I don't think Mike Tyson to fight a great white? I think he's just going to go underneath there and, like, you know, dance around. And yeah, that'll be a, yeah, you know, I think it's the ballsiness <laughs> of going in against a shark. You know, what the I mean, physics, it's a great white, too. 
the physics it's a big boy it's not a, a little freaking tiny little coral shark or anything it's a it's supposed to be like a big boy well he ain't rope a dope and nothing underwater well, and, I mean, the, the whole really story, it's for, him, it's, it's for him to to get psyched up to get back into the ring. You know what I mean? He, it's like jumping no, off I a bridge at all. on a hang glider <laughs> to get ready to do something. You know, he's, he's trying to get his adrenaline up and, and like, because he's the baddest man on, on planet Earth. <laughs> got to prove it. Right. But I need, I got to find, there's got to be some description in one of these fucking stories of exactly... By the way, I have what's to... this nonsense with everybody demanding that you accept their cookies to read their shit on the website now? That's kind of bullshit. Yeah, they do that with porn, too. Uh, Two years. Well, it's it's a a it's frequent visitor, frequent flyer miles. <laughs> yeah, I, I, always either, I always either close that shit or they, they, they have a thing that says more options. And if you usually if you click through this thing that says more options, you can like maybe like say, I don't accept any of this shit and it'll go away. But it's just like it's, it's just annoying. It's annoying as fuck. Yeah, it's bullshit. <laughs> Are you a citizen of Norway, John Mark Clicks? Yes. <laughs> Other hey, uh, Ron, check out Discovery Shark Week, and that, it'll probably show you there, because there's a video of it right there. Okay, well, here's a. it says, although specifics about the bout have not been confirmed, Tyson said that he took on this challenge to overcome his fears, as Lyle said. Um, so the details have not really been released. It'll be one of these things where we have to sign. I mean, talk about jumping the shark. <laughs> Right. Man, what if he really does fucking fight a shark, <laughs> and the shark just fucking eats him? It's like one of those ridiculous well, he... things, like a stunt gone wrong, and bloop, it's just bloop, bloop, bloop. Like, a dead half. Like, like Dyson like floats pose. to the surface. Have you? Have, have any no. of you guys? I know Ron, you probably have, but have you? Any, uh, the rest of you guys seen that movie Zombie? Uh, mm -hmm. The old one, the Italian one. Z o m b i, yeah, Lucio, Lucio Fulci. Yeah. There's with the with the zombie fighting a shark. Uh, it's been so long since I saw it, but I feel like I've seen so many things fighting a shark in movies at this point that they're all blurring. Oh, it's the best. But you yeah, gotta it's, imagine, it's... like even a Mike Tyson punch underwater. <laughs> I, I refuse to believe that Mike Tyson is planning on fighting a real shark, like no. mono no. Sharko. But again, uh, yes, take my money. But if. But... <laughs> Yeah, that, whatever that it is, I'm going to tune no. in. But Listen. to go back to your question, Chris. <laughs> Let me tell you exactly what happens. I know. I've seen it. In the dream. most amazing sports. Uh, a shark swims event straight at him. Of the ages. Swims, just swims straight at him. And Mike Tyson winds up <laughs> this giant fucking punch. <laughs> they collide. And it's just an explosion of meat. <laughs> and the shark continues on. Just mm -hmm. the red book mm -hmm. like eat everywhere. Yeah. But you know what's left? An ear floating slowly down. <laughs> and in the I crowd, Evander Holyfield, Evander Holyfield rolls one single tear of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> it's the greatest day of my life. Well, speaking of uh, Evander, he's, uh, apparently he's been quoted as saying, I might be up for a rematch. Two, uh, and he's like 55 or 56, so two old fogies in the ring. Uh, two old fogies, by the way, that I don't think most sane humans would want to challenge, even in their uh, Prime. <laughs> even in their senior years. Um, but we shall see about the shark business. That's, that's the story of the century, if Mike Tyson is actually going to punch a damn shark on TV. But I what's think we all agree that crazy. this is going to be something not quite that. Uh, yeah. But he does end in this particular article. I learned from doing this experience, Shark Week, that whatever intimidates me, I should say it in his voice, which is a terrible. Uh, well, no, I won't. It's hard to you bite your tongue and say it when you talk like this. <laughs> I'm still able to step up to the challenge and overcome in anything that would prevent me from accomplishing my life's mission of reaching my highest potential in life and bringing me closer to God. Well, punching a, sh a great white shark, <laughs> that could quite possibly bring you to God. Uh, so, Godspeed. <laughs> we shall tune in. Oh, it's not That's the sound you'll hear. Underwater. Of meat. <laughs> And, uh, it's just, and what is it's Evander doing there? <laughs> well, it's just it's just weird that he's doing both this shark fighting thing and, and the Holyfield fight. fight because he he was just saying not too long ago that like he he wasn't even working out anymore because yeah. when he worked out it would make him feel it gave him that feeling of like the bad shit that he felt back in the day that that that, that anger and that rage that he had that to chant that the tap into when he was doing his fights and stuff and he's just like I just don't. I'm not that person anymore, and I don't want to feel like that, so I don't even work out, you know? 
Mm. Um, so I, hopefully he, he got over that and he's able to come at it from a different place. Well, that's you know? what he's trying to get back from the shark. Yeah. He's yeah. trying to find yeah. his inner killer. He's like, I, <laughs> like it, it's the Bible of the fittest up in here. <laughs> Let's just do the rest of the cast as Tyson. Come on. <laughs> anyway, stories of vengeance. Uh, <clears throat> I'm basically doing some sort of like in living color <laughs> impersonation of him. Um, well, that's good shit. Uh, Martian rover that might, may or may not be coming back. Good look into them shits. But I, that's all been hijacked now. I want to know if Mike Tyson is really going to punch a damn shark. Couldn't possibly. But we'll see what that's all about on August 9th. Tune in uh, for anyone that has TV, which I don't. I guess there'll probably be some way of seeing it online. But well, I think we've all, <laughs> at one point or another, had a craving for vengeance, and sometimes we've acted on them. Uh, usually, hopefully, we just Man. act them out in our heads and then move on. But mm-hmm. sometimes you just gotta make them pay. You no, know? and there mm-hmm. is that. You just gotta leave. <laughs> sometimes you just gotta leave that upper decker in the round street. <laughs> sometimes you do, only to be nosed out six months later. Sometimes you gotta punch a shark. <laughs> sometimes you just gotta do shit. Uh, oh my God. As is the case with all of these stories that I'll be bringing you tonight. And up first is a fascinating tale of Mariah Oktaya Berskuya, I think is how you properly botch that name. Uh, and it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's sad that I have to botch it because this is a pretty badass woman and a badass tale. Now, Mariah was born a, a fairly poor Crimean uh, to a fairly poor Crimean family. And as she came of age, she developed a very strong sense of pride and belief in her communist home, the USSR. And as a young adult, she met another lad that shared these similar principles named Ilya. And they quickly married, and not long after the honeymoon, World War II broke out. And they had both joined the Red Army, to fight for Stalin. Now, Stalin, of course, was an ally of Hitler and the Nazis in the beginning of the war, but that changed as things went on. And uh, one night during the siege of Kiev, Ilya was captured and tortured and killed by the Nazis. Mariah did not take this well. (laughs) Pretty distraught, as you can imagine, but rather than letting this tragedy keep her from doing her national duties... She actually scraped up all the money she could find. She sold everything she owned to buy herself a T-34 tank so that she could personally (sighs) run over and crush Nazis. How how did she earn this money? (laughs) By selling everything she had um, and begging the rest. (laughs) Wow. This this was uh, not a regular thing for several reasons, of course. So uh, Mariah had to contact Stalin himself to get permission. And in the letter that she wrote, uh, one of the quotes was, my husband was killed in action defending the motherland. I want revenge on the fascist dogs for his death and for the death of Soviet people tortured by the fascist barbarians. And Stalin was like, all right, (laughs) not much to lose, really. Go get him, Tigris. (laughs) You know, it, it seems he must have thought realized that it was a a good story for wartime propaganda you know an impassioned wife distraught over the death of her husband now on a personal crusade against the fascist nazis so she got her tank and w- with her leader's permission and she set out to crush some nazi bones and she named her tank the fighting girlfriend And her very first tank battle was in October of 1943, and as the battalion of tanks that she rode with made their way toward a pretty large pocket of German soldiers, uh, Fighting Girlfriend was the very first tank across the line into enemy territory. Uh, And then she started happily firing fist-sized holes into every Nazi she could put in her gun sights. And then proceeded to pin soldiers up against the brick mortars, uh, smashing them, running them over. It's pretty a maneuverable tank that she was operating. Where's the movie about this bitch? I know. uh, There's got to be some some works of fiction or, uh, you know, bio uh, about her out there. 
but she's pretty legendary. <laughs> Definitely look her up. There's a lot of more de lot more details, uh, including like times where she was in the midst of a battle, and rather than you know writing it out and just sort of letting it pass, because a lot of these tanks were fairly indestructible for what the ground troops had on them. You know, a, a grenade wasn't going to handle it. Bullets weren't going to handle it. Um, so they could just park it there and be like, I'm going to let this blow over, radio in for help, or crawl out. She wouldn't do that. She would hop out the hatch, fix whatever was damaged from uh, her, her tracks, the tires, or whatever, the mechanisms. She'd fix it herself while bullets were whizzing over her head, hop back in, and go smash more fucking Nazis. Wow. Yeah. What a fucking badass. Yeah, pretty amazing. And depending on how many, you know, the reports vary. And, of course, a story like this is going to be embellished. But the reports are somewhere between 15, uh, 15 20, or 50 Nazis in that one battle that she personally smashed <laughs> with her fucking tank that she bought by selling everything she owned to avenge her husband's death. Uh, now, from the battle zone, she once wrote a letter to her sister uh, giving you a little insight of her state of mind in the midst of all this chaos. And one quote was, I've had my baptism by fire. I beat the bastards. Sometimes I'm so angry I can't even breathe. And she would also write about how she couldn't sleep. Like she couldn't wait to, to get up and kill more Nazis the next day. Like she was so filled with rage wow. and a vengeful heart. She that... became something yeah, wow. she became a, a monster, <laughs> a good kind, the best possible kind of monster. Now, sadly, uh, her Nazi smashing days came to an end in January 1944 during the Red Army's Leningrad offensive. But she, she lived her vow, you know, and she, she bought her own fucking tank and spent the rest of her short life crushing the skulls of the Nazi army in memory of her husband. Fucking Christ! How about that? We should all we should all be so lucky, right? Yeah, salute, <laughs> salute. I'll drink to that. Wow. It's not vodka, but that was fucking fantastic. We got some great ones coming up too. Uh, next, this is a a vengeance mini tale, if you will. Author Michael Crichton got a pretty nasty dose of revenge on a critic that once talked shit about him. Crichton, of course, wrote uh, most famously Jurassic Park. The Andre. Uh, Andromeda Strain, which is pretty timely <laughs> if you think about it. It's a very outbreak type uh, book, but dozens of best selling books. Very well known author, uh, but critic Michael Crowley didn't like Crichton's recent book at the time, State of Fear, and he was pretty snarky about it. So in Crichton's next book, called Next, he wrote a character by the name of Mick Crowley who, just like the critic Michael Crowley, was a photojournalist that had graduated from Yale. Unlike Michael Crowley, Mick Crowley was also a child rapist with a tiny dick. <laughs> Boom. Revenge. Right there. Right in the kisser. Don't piss off popular authors, man. They will wow. write you as a child rapist. <laughs> I love that that's not enough. <laughs> You're a child rapist with a tiny dick. Only, only a man would write that. Next up, here is a uh, tale of revenge right the fuck out of Game of Thrones. I almost ended with this one, but I decided to end with one with a different slant to it. 10th century Kiev, going back to sticking with Russia, actually. Princess Olga was married to Prince Igor, and they were quite in love when a neighboring tribe called the, Dre the Drevlians? The Drev it must be Drevlians. Um, interesting word, but the the, Drevli the Drevlians attacked and killed Igor, once again, leaving a, a devastated and enraged wife behind. Uh, very bad choice, Drevy babies, because, again, they, they continue to put more salt in the wound here when the, the Drevlians began sending Princess Olga suitors from their own tribe for her to marry. Like, okay, well, we killed that pesky husband of yours. Now marry one of our own. <laughs> but she was clever enough. But deal's a deal. To, she was a princess, remember. She had power, and she had an army, and she had a castle, and they had a fortress. But she was clever enough to allow them passage to the castle. One by one, and often in groups, these suitors 
were brought to the castle on a boat, and once they were off the boat, they were led right to a giant trench where they were all buried alive by Olga's henchmen. Oh my god, you're... What? Oh, it gets better. <laughs> uh, knowing that... You know, all this happened really quickly, but knowing that uh, a wedding was inevitable, uh, more Dravillians <laughs> came to the castle, and as a courtesy, knowing that these travelers had you know, come away, so they'd be tired and dirty, uh, Princess Olga sent them all to a complimentary bathhouse. Mm -hmm, nice little relaxing bathhouse. And once they were inside the doors, uh, those doors were locked, and the entire building was set on fire. <laughs> Uh, history records that you could wild. you could hear the screams through the entire town as oh. everybody slowly slowly burned to death um, that, that, she's not done <laughs> by this point she'd had enough of this back and forth so she decided no more no more uh, Mrs. Nice Gal she launched a full on war against this uh, Trevelyan village and things were going her way for a while but oddly enough she decided you know what? I, I no more fighting she's like listen i'm going to give you a peace offering if you the Dravillians, bring me a large flock of doves we will consider the war over so they brought her the doves and she promptly tied hot coal embers to their feet let them loose and they flew back to where they came from and burned the entire village down Look it up, folks. <laughs> wow. Princess what, Olga. What year was this? What, what era? 10th century Kiev. Wow. So it's like the 900s. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Where's the movie on that? Did Where I, is the movie on that? I told that? you, them shits was, that's like right out of Game of Thrones. Don't fuck with a Russian princess. <laughs> uh, this next one lives on in infamy in a, a sort of different way. This is the legend of Joaquin Murrieta. Now, Murrieta was born in Mexico, uh, and as he became an adult, he headed north to California during the great gold rush of the, the early 1900s. And at this point, he was married, and he brought his wife with him. And the gold rush, as you might imagine, was a fairly lawless <laughs> and disorganized endeavor in many ways and among all the other aspects uh, that made it a dark and sketchy world at the time racism was quite ra rampant and you know the white claimers didn't take kindly to mexicans getting in on <laughs> that their gold and them nar hills and after one particularly horrible scuffle with some of these white settlers uh, Murrieta was tied up and forced to watch as the other men violently raped and killed his wife right in front of him. Ugh. Yeah, it was brutal. Uh, and you can imagine what this does to a person. Now, he, first and foremost, he was filled with a, a need to get the fuck out of there. You know, it was like he was outnumbered. He didn't have any friends. This was the white man's territory, uh, which makes him sound Native American. What's the other word? Um, gringo. This was Gringo's territory. Well, though that doesn't really work because Gringo would be a white man in Mexico. Anyway, it was the white man's world, and he knew he needed to get the fuck out of Dodge. So he headed into town and basically just got little small jobs here and there, and eventually he ended up being a dealer uh, at a blackjack table in one of the, town, uh, the casinos in town. <laughs> but again, like you can imagine, he, he quickly found that life wasn't much better for a Mexican in a white town uh, behind a fucking blackjack table. There's a lot of instances of violence. And at some point, his brother came up to join him from Mexico. His brother and uh, Joaquin were both falsely accused of stealing a horse or a mule, some variations in the story by this angry posse of white men and they were like dragged right out of the bar and his brother was hung like right in the middle of town now Joaquin managed to get by with uh, a horse whipping but after that you know he was basically just face down in the dirt looking at his dead brother hanging up swaying in the wind uh, watching this posse wander off into the distance Jesus yeah you can see how this sets up 
<laughs> a good vengeance tale. Like a great fucking movie. Yeah, I do want to see that. Well, uh, it's interesting where this <laughs> character kind of ended up. Um, but he gets the nastiest, gnarliest dudes he can find with just enough, just enough of a moral compass and just enough sanity to sort of be selective and be able to follow some sort of instruction because what he wanted to do was ghastly and violent and um, a sweeping campaign of destruction, <laughs> but it had to be specific. It couldn't be chaotic. So he, he got his gang of banditos hell bent on basically one simple mission, killing the people that done him wrong and stealing the gringo's money to give to his people for a better life and a, a more fighting chance to make it because they had a legal right to be there just as anybody did, you know, this territory and all that, you know, of course it started out as Mexico and then the laws and the borders kind of got a little bit wonky there, but they, they were there legally. This wasn't, it wasn't like they didn't have uh, the legal right to try to go up and dig their own gold. And Murrieta was very successful. He, he was lucky with the gold strikes, which is why so many of the white people attacked him, stole his shit and inevitably, uh, or eventually, I should say, raped and killed his wife. So he's got his gang, and he starts to find these people. He, he kind of gets them one by one. They hunt him down and killed every single one of them that he could find. Uh, and in many cases, Muriette allegedly killed him with his bare hands himself. Uh, not just shootings, not just swordplay. <laughs> or whatever uh, else you might imagine being the weapon of the day. And he did this. This was his life's work. And then he did that sort of Robin Hood thing. He would go back to his people and share that wealth. He did this all the way up until his death in 1853 when he was killed in a gunfight between his gang and a group of California Rangers. Now, most historians think that some of these legends have grown into... Uh, well, just being legends. There, there's enough history on the books that the story still maintains that he was a Robin Hood sort of bandit that lived those tales in earnest. And That's uh, the best. Pulp Fiction writer Johnston McCauley accredits Murrieta as being the real-life inspiration for one of his most famous creations. Uh, can you guys take a, take a stab, no pun intended, at the... Uh, Pulp Fiction character of yore that lives on basically forever. Not as big of a character nowadays as it was a while back. The Lone Ranger. Mm, it's not a bad guess. Very similar. Do you know what Shadow? that character was? Mm, no. Another good guess. Uh, Christopher, you got a guess? I don't know this guy's work, so I, I'm like... Rrr. I was like Robin Hood. Yeah, or well, a lot of people <laughs> is one of those situations where you don't know the, the creator, but you definitely know the name Zorro. Oh. Uh. And that okay. was yeah. uh, oh, oh, there, yeah. sure. based on the tale of mm. Joaquin Murrieta in that terrible you know, I didn't, story of revenge. I never, I never read the books or um, watched the old show, but I fell in love with the story when I saw the Anto Antonio Banderas version, The Mask of Zorro. <laughs> that was a great story. I mean, like the, those, the Zorro. There's nothing yeah, wrong with that, man. That was a great yeah. movie. I, I thought it was a great movie. I remember liking it anyway. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, anywho, uh, <laughs> moving on this one, we all, we all know the story, but I didn't know a lot of the details. So I'm guessing that most people probably don't. And this is the tale. The, this is a, the most recent tale that I'm talking about tonight. The story of the killdozer. You guys remember that? The rampage. I just Dude. literally had a friend reach out to me and say, you need to do a story on Killdozer. And he did a little animation with it and is like a scholar on it. So oh. perhaps I will sit down with him and let him do a flesh out like a 20 minute story about it. And we can put it up as an episode when we're taking an off week or something. Yeah, for sure. Because I'm sure yeah. he'll have all sorts of details that uh, I won't have here. This is the story of Marvin Hemeyer, a man that <laughs> lost his fucking shit, but in a very calculative and, you know, a, a, so often when somebody feels they've been wronged and they want a slice of revenge, these are 
outlashes, you know, their, their impulsive actions. This was one that was planned over a significant period of time. Now, he Meyer, uh, it's, it's kind of a sad one here too, but he owned a little welding shop in Granby, Colorado and seemed fairly content with his life until a large concrete company made plans to put a new plant next to he Meyer's land. And there's some back and forth negotiating. And at one point it was like a flat out no. And then the, the concrete company offered them some money that was negotiated and renegotiated. And eventually this all sort of ended up in court and, uh, or at least, you know, at, at city hall, he was trying to do things. He Meyer was trying to do things the, the legal way, changing the zoning, you know, this all had to do with zoning, uh, and he was, it seemed like everybody he was coming up against was on the side of the concrete plant. I mean, you got to imagine that even a small concrete plant is going to employ a chunk of people. And that's going to be something that could be a boon to the, the city. So it seemed like everyone was like, yeah, sorry, small welding shop guy, but uh, we're going to go ahead with this. But there was at some point an agreement uh, reached, at least it seemed like it. The cement plant agreed to buy out a portion of Hemeyer's land, but uh, left him enough so that the two entities could coexist. But when the zoning commission ultimately revealed their construction plans, Hemeyer claimed that it basically blocked all of his entryways and essentially made it impossible for him to do business. So he tried again. He fought this for years and years, better part of a decade, I, I believe. Um, but, you know, at this point, certain papers had been signed, permits had been issued, and he was basically denied. So <laughs> he decided to handle things a different way. And over the next year and a half, Marvin basically spent all his free time, uh, day and night, tinkering away in his shed under a large, mysterious tarp. And on June 4th of 2004... He pulled the tarp off what we now call the killdozer. This is a massive, fortified, and weaponized bulldozer. A very powerful piece of machinery that was made basically indestructible and impenetrable. <laughs> the it, pictures are fucking crazy. Yeah, the vi there's video of it, uh, of course. I mean, helicopter footage of him just going from spot to spot. I think Effie brought this story up several times too. She's always talking. Probably. Is this up in is this up in Canada? I can't recall. No, this was in Colorado. Oh, okay. Uh, there Ron, was I you mean, might you. I'm sure you're familiar, but I don't know if the rest of the guys are with the band Killdozer, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, were they before or after this? I I what what, what was the year again? 2004. I feel like Killdozer was before Two, that. Killdozer was before that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, well, it was named Killdozer. I think, I think it was like a just some journalist, a blogger that was writing about it. It, it just, it just one of those things where somebody called it that and it took. So who knows? Maybe I'm sure. Maybe I'm, he I'm was sure, inspired I'm by sure the band. He must have come across the name. I'm sure he must have come across the name somewhere because it was like you know, whatever. But yeah, yeah, your brain Crazy. isn't automatically going to go to Killdozer. It does now, but anyway. So June four, two thousand four. This thing goes trucking down the street. It's got steel plates. It's got concrete walls inside the steel plates. It's got three-inch plastic bulletproof windows over the lenses of three video cameras so that he can see all around him and ports all uh, around him with different calibers of guns that he could take care of biz from any angle with any level of... Uh, viciousness shall we say because one of those guns was a 22 uh so it, it's well that ties into to where we go but he basically just went on a rampage but it wasn't random <laughs> you know he uh he hopped in lowered the impossibly heavy lid down and again more on that in a bit and proceeded into town where he went on a two-hour rampage and he started exactly where you might guess uh, well, actually, he he, he, agenda. he he went through his own business and then drove uh, into the concrete plant and did as much damage as he could there. Almost got stuck there a couple of times. All this. Well, not every minute of it was captured, but uh, a big chunk of this was captured uh, on camera, of course. 
And then he headed up to City Hall, smashed that up, uh, smashing the shit out of uh, <laughs> a few things in his way, a couple of vehicles, uh, newspaper building, fucked up uh, a, a couple of homes. Then he ended up being, there was a hardware store that he, there's footage of this because by this time the helicopters were all over the place. Like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Remember, this went on for over two hours. Uh, as it culminated to an end, he drove through, like, through the, the corner of this hardware store and uh, the police were shooting the shit out of him. They were trying grenades. Nothing could touch it. Remember, this is like a, a, <laughs> a concrete machine uh, on metal, on steel tracks. And authorities figured out fairly, e fairly early that uh, who was likely inside based on people calling in, based on the targets. Uh, you know, the newspaper was against him, he thought, in the coverage of his city council fight. Um, city hall was against him. The owner of the hardware store sat on the city council. That kind of thing. Making his list, checking it <laughs> twice. <laughs> Gonna find out who flattens real nice. <laughs> Kill Dozer is coming. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it, and but there was also, they were trying to hop on top and just get <laughs> the fucking hatch open. Nothing doing. Uh, it, it wouldn't budge. Now, finally, after barreling into the corner of that hardware store, the Dozer fell into uh, sort of like a small section of the basement and got stuck. And the SWAT team, who had, been on his tail the whole time surrounded him they, you know they were ready for whatever was next but as they're wait, waiting for him to either emerge or they're still desperately trying to fight their way in they heard a single gunshot fire from within the uh, vehicle and they kept scrambling to get the hatch open and ev they even brought explosives in at that point and was like fire in the hole nothing doing <laughs> this thing was a fortress on tracks now uh i don't know i think it was tracks not wheels now eventually they got a high-powered gas torch of some sort that could cut through thick steel and they got into the tank through one of those steel panels and that's where they found a quite dead marvin hemeyer with a bullet hole in his head now going back to that lid it was clear that hemeyer had no intention of getting out of that tank once he had sealed that lid the weight and the way that it was uh, fashioned and just, it, there was no opening it. A one-way so, ticket, huh? Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was clear that there was a plan to do as much destruction as possible and then check out. Uh, now, he did might... They ever, did they ever say how much damage he did overall? Like $7 million. Oh, my God. Yeah, and that's 20 years ago. So, yeah, well over $10 million worth of damage today and... It's amazing. It's amazing no one died except for him. It's amazing no one really got hurt except for him. Uh, now, it, we'll talk a bit more about that in, in a minute. But uh, he did leave notes and recordings. You can hear some of these recordings online of his motives, like right before the attack even, and mostly about the property dispute. But he also seemed to think that there was a higher calling to it uh, here's a not crazy at all sounding quote from old marvy baby just before the deed quote i think god will bless me to get the machine done to drive it to do the stuff that i have to do god blessed me in advance for that task and i am about that i'm about to undertake it is my duty god has asked me to do this it's a cross that I'm going to carry, and I'm carrying it in God's name. Do you uh, do you think he was a holy roller? <laughs> well, that tracks. <laughs> oh. Keep it going. Keep it going. Uh, now, some do praise Marvin as a bit of a hero of the common man pushed too far, you know, by the powers that be, uh, especially since nobody other than he died in the rampage, and. <laughs> although God knows they could have, you know, there's no way that he could have known who or what was standing on the other side of any of these walls that he just rushed into with this fucking tank. So I don't really buy necessarily the thing that he didn't mean to do any harm. Um, unless the right person got much like <laughs> some of these earlier stories, unless the right person was in his sights. You know what I mean? Um, 
there are other people that think that this was simply a self-indulgent baby throwing a temper tantrum and ultimately taking the easy road out at the end of it. But either way, the motherfucker got some revenge and a pretty good chunk of immortality. God, he was just fucking rock hard the whole time he was doing that. You know it. Jacking off. <laughs> I'm goddamn kill dozer. Uh, moving on. This story has inspired not only many a Western, but just stories in general. It's a classic setup for the uh, <laughs> revenge story. Maybe one of the oldest in the book. Frank Eaton. Uh, the living embodiment of the old Western trope. I'm looking for the man that shot my pa. Because <laughs> when Eaton was eight, year, eight years old, his dad, who was an active vigilante, was gunned down by another group of vigilantes over one disagreement or another. The details of why uh, were kind of sketchy on the stories that I read. But as if that wasn't traumatic enough to an eight-year-old kid, one of Frank's dad's best friend uh, looked at little Frank, I think this was at his uh, funeral, and said, may an old man's curse fall upon you if you don't avenge your father. Oh, no. I'm so going to say that Sounds to like... one of my pal's kids <clears throat> if they die. Let's see what happens. I'm... Oh, fuck. Sounds like a Johnny Cash. <laughs> yeah, it is a Johnny Cash. Well, that's the thing. This this story has inspired so many things. I'm sure there are songs written about it. Uh, yeah, that poor fucking kid. But you never know what's going to happen with this sort of thing. He set out at a very young age to do just that. Uh, now, the same pal took the young boy under his wing, taught him how to shoot a gun, taught him how to fight, uh, you know, to track people, to hide his tracks, basically showing him how to... It was, it was essentially, you can imagine, like a typical training montage shit in a movie for the uh, bounty hunter set, <laughs> I guess. But when Frank was 15... He wanted to continue his training, so he approached the military. Uh, he knew he was too young to join, but he wanted any assistance he could get. They wouldn't let him enlist, of course, but they humored him. And so they at first just let him practice with them at the shooting range. And then later on, when they realized how good he was, like he joined some of their exercises on the range. And he quickly grew to outshooting even the hot shots of the army. And so they all nicknamed him Pistol Pete. <laughs> he was a teenager. Uh, now, he was working on his aim pretty much nonstop, and when he was 20, he actually became a bona fide marshal, one of the youngest in history, in United States history, uh, 20 years old. And he did all this while upkeeping his regular duties as a lawman, but now he had a badge, he had resources, and he was ready to hunt down the six men that killed his pop. And he did just that. <laughs> One by one, he met up with them and won in a shootout every time. Uh, except one. There was one that he couldn't wow. kill. And <laughs> the only reason he couldn't kill him was because he went ahead and died on his own before Frank could shoot him. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, this one doesn't have a ton of recorded history with it. So this, uh, uh, more than the rest of them, probable to have some embellishments. But most accounts paint that exact portrait of Frank Pistol Pete Eaton avenging his father's death. Completely avenging his father's death. Great story. Yeah, he, that is great. That's a good one. All right, one more. This... Uh, <laughs> This one's hard to believe for many reasons, but it's all true. And this is fairly recent, too. In the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, in the slums of New Delhi, were being tormented by a serial rapist. And he was known. I mean, like, everyone knew his name. His name was Aku Yadav. Now, Yadav is thought to at least have raped over 200 women. That we know of. Uh, in fact, so many, like, proportionately to this village that... The authorities guessed that one in two houses had somebody under that roof that he had raped. One in two. 50% of the homes uh, had somebody that had been raped by this one guy. Uh, now, the New Delhi government, the police, nobody would do anything. Because, well, a couple, a couple reasons. First and foremost, this th they were slums. And... 
at this time, in this place, they didn't care what happened to these people. They saw them as a nuisance. They saw them as lesser human beings, and it wasn't worth their time to investigate, and it wasn't worth their time to arrest. You know, why should we arrest this man for raping a, a woman that we don't consider to be of equal standards to us? That was the mentality. That was half of the mentality. The other mentality was just payoffs, because Yadav eventually did rape someone of a certain status, and he was arrested. But he was let go before he even got to the jail because he paid off the cops. Then later off, he paid off the courts. He wasn't a wealthy man, but, you know, 50 cents, a buck here, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, pay me and I'll drop you off. Because, again, we don't ultimately care. But it, it, there, there was one victim that he raped, and this was a repeated victim. A lot of these victims were repeat victims. Um, you know, he would just come back and rape him over and over again. Well, one of these repeat victims had set up a bit of an ambush with some of her family and friends. And they all captured Yadav and they hauled him straight to the police department. But the police were laughing and joking and straight up saying he's going to be free again soon. But whatever. They realized that there was a, a hullabaloo this time. So they thought they would humor these women by putting him in jail for a few days and eventually they'd have like a mock trial and he'd be back on his feet. This got the attention of other women in the city, not just women that had been raped by him, but other women that were, you know, it, it's a sad reality that most of the women in this one area, because of the reasons that I just said, they were easy pickings for, you know, a predatory type because they knew that even if they got caught, no one was going to care. So most of these women had been raped, even if it wasn't by Yadav. But uh, a good chunk of them were specifically raped by this man. So they started showing up to these uh, court hearings. And Yadav was led into the courtroom and had to pass by all these women <laughs> that were there to see justice done. But again, the police, even in that moment, were laughing at them. And Yadav said out loud in court as he passed these women, all of these women are loose, and that is why I rape them, and that is why I will rape them again. Oh, God. In court. And the cops' response to that was laughter. Like, oh, wow. the classic Yadav. Yeah, put yourself in. I mean, talk about a hopeless <laughs> place of oppression and, I mean, just a horrible, horrible environment that's hard to imagine. But as the day progressed, it became clear to these women that they were go that this was a dog and pony show. They were going to let you out of walk. They were doing this to basically humor the women to get them to shut the fuck up and go home. So the women decided to take justice into their own hands. And they had thought about this ahead of time. Now, keep in mind, there were over 200 women that had showed up here. This is that's a significant chunk of people. They had all stowed away anything they could find, vegetable knives, sharp rocks, uh, tools, anything that could do harm but was small enough to tuck under their, their garments. They brought him into the court in case things went the way they expected him to go. And when they did, they all rushed Yadav with such a vengeance <laughs> that it was basically a riot. And the police were so scared that they left the courtroom. Everybody left the courtroom and just left the women yeah, to but. their own devices. Now, they got some rope. They tied up Yadav, and they started to lift him up over a rafter to give him a good proper lynching. As he started to choke on the rope, he screamed, Please, I'm so sorry. I won't do it again. Now, before he could choke to death, they all started stabbing him and beating him. Uh, so brutally with whatever implement they had, in some cases their bare hands or their sandals, anything to get a piece of that man's death. Uh, they beat him so brutally that he was essentially disemboweled. And there is a photo online of the aftermath of it, and it's just it's like you slaughtered a fucking cow. Uh, and he was basically dead in about 15 minutes. Um, but the women kept stabbing long after that. They were stabbing wow. his bones. They had so much anger inside of him. One witness said, fucking justice, bro. Now, the police did try to convict some of these women for murder, but in I thought you a... just said, one witness said, fucking justice, bro. <laughs> <laughs> fucking justice, bro. <laughs> That's how the American uh, retelling of the story would go. 
The police did try to convict some of them for murder, but in a Spartacus-like act of solidarity, dozens uh, or more came forward and said, no, I was the one that basically did the first stabbing. I was the one that basically killed him. And they ultimately couldn't really determine who did it, and they couldn't prove who did it and who didn't. So they essentially all walked. And there was a mighty celebration uh, for about a week in the streets of the slums of New Delhi. And you've got to believe that that made some would-be rapists in that area think twice before prowling those slums for their next victim. Yeah. So, And in terms of revenge, it doesn't get a lot better than that. So, wow. Yeah, I those are fantastic. There were a lot of great stories, so I'll probably do another. <laughs> I'll probably do a part two in the not-too-distant future. But right now... So uh, I have a little game show tonight for you guys. Well, it's just a list. It's a list game, but I'm going to turn it into a game show of sorts. Uh, Regis Philbin fucking died. I don't know why that rocked me a little bit, but it did. <laughs> uh, it's just one of those deaths. I was just like, I've never been like super fucking into anything he's ever done. I, I just am always aware of him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and he was one of those ce celebrities for me that uh, – took a turn and his age really shocked like seeing how much he'd aged in the last 10 years just was like i don't know i'm constantly reminded of mortality lately i don't know about you guys sure. mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh just seeing them him age and then dead i'm just like fuck so he's been on my brain a lot lately so i thought it'd be fun to look at because he's a famous game show host with who wants to be a millionaire he had this like incredible resurgence of popularity in the uh, late 90s. I think 1999 was when that started, I think. Um, so I thought, what were the fucking most popular game shows of all time? So I have a list here of the most popular, as ranked on Ranker. I know we all have mixed feelings sometimes about how these lists pan out. But these are, as I understand it, voted by the people. And I think this one's pretty solid. I think it's pretty predictable for the most part. So here's what we're going to do. Okay. Wait, did you have a question? Well, I'm just, no, it, it, it's, I'm sure it is straightforward, but it's also, that's the question is, is it the who wants to be a millionaire era that most people would pick or would it be classic? Uh, anyway, there is a variety okay. and I think that the top five are probably legitimate. Uh, you know, so okay. what I'm going to do here gotcha. is I'm going to give you guys each four opportunities to, uh, pick and I will award you points, and we'll do it in that reverse number way. So, like, it, we're going to go basically top 20 are worth points. If you get number one, it's worth 20 points. If you get number two, it's worth 19 points, and so on. I, I can't think of a better way to score this. And if anyone has suggestions, please send them my way. But it seems to work pretty well. I think it works, yeah. Um, yeah. Also, there is uh, a opportunity for a bit of a final jeopardy of sorts at the end where you will be able to wager the points you have earned. That's exciting. Okay, uh, the order we're going to play tonight is Lyle will go first, Ron will go second, and John Mark will go third. So Lyle, I'm giving you an, a tremendous opportunity to get some points right off the bat here. You ready? Yeah, hit Do me. It. The Price is Right. Bam! The Price is Right is the second most popular game. Second. Uh, <clears throat> the Son of a bitch. Strong game. Uh, it's number two. Oh, Boom. Boy, okay, roster. Two in my head. I got it. I got to go. My first guest. It, uh, hmm. <laughs> I know. I feel like I know the top three. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go with Jeopardy for number one. Mm. Jeopardy is the number one most popular oh, game show yes. of all time. Yeah, you gotta go with all Jeopardy. Time. Come on now. Well, the what I th what I'm guessing is in. The third position could have very easily been the first position, too. Right. John, <laughs> Miggity Mark. And that would have been Wheel of Fortune. Yep. Wheel of Fortune oh, is the number four most Whoa. popular game show of all time. Okay. So we're gonna get As voted. Now, I do, I do disagree with that. I think that the game show that is above it is not as popular, but uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people obviously voted it up, and maybe it was close. Okay. I know, uh, but I know there's three. one that I've been watching a lot of lately. Yeah. Okay, John Mark picked uh, Wheel of Fortune. That's with number four. Okay. Uh, round two, Lyle. What you going with? Sounds Are you ready? Are you ready? Sounds Hold it down. Hit me. Oh, shit. Hit me. 
A family feud. Ooh, that's what I was going to guess. It's got to be four, right? Excellent. Surveys Excellent are... pick at number three. Wheel of Fortune was yes. four. Oh, yeah, number three. Yeah. Well, Sarah and I so we've already a shit. To... Let's see. The Family Feud is a great fucking show. So we've already got the top four locked down. So this, I think, this is a pretty solid list. I, I do. So now it's going to get more interesting, though. Yeah. See. Okay. Uh, Ronster. Um, let's go with. Oh boy! See now, I feel like I got to pick like a Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Final answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, that was fucking great. <laughs> it was great. That was a pretty good setup. Mm-hmm. Uh, number five on the list. No, yeah, right. As, as good as you could have done. Yeah. John Mark. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of through the, all the ones. So one of my favorites, one of my favorite show, game shows of all time was was <laughs> Press Your Luck when they had no whammies, oh, no whammies, yeah. no whammies. It's got to be on the list. I bet but, it's not super it's high. It's got to be on the list somewhere. But I don't think that's in the probably the top. It might be in the top ten, but I'm going to go with instead. I'm going to go with um, uh, let's make a deal. Let's make a deal mm, is yeah. number seven. Wow. Number seven. Good. Yes. Well, press your luck. I bet would be somewhere on there. You guys remember when I did the uh, <laughs> the story about the guy that cheated? Yeah, it was great. Did a whole bunch of games. Uh, show. That'd be a good one to rerun. All right, we're moving into round three here, Lyle. I'm going to go. I was going to go with Press Your Luck. That was my favorite show uh, as a kid growing up to watch. Yeah, it's because fun. Because I thought the, the whammies were the shit. They're pretty cool. <laughs> but so you anything with... that had cartoons in it, yeah. Uh, so uh, during that time period, there used to be one that was the $10,000 Pyramid. And oh, that show yeah. Was... I love that show. That was a good show. Then it became the $25,000 Pyramid. Must be up to a million now. Shit. Inflation. I was going to rip off. Uh, part of that for you know we were going to do that radar station <laughs> game show i was going to use one round was going to be straight up rip off of that anyway so uh, um are you going with Pyra- pyramid low yeah. yeah number eight on the list well done sir <laughs> okay wow we are just Bro. kind of like so six hasn't good. been six, six is the only snores. gap in the top seven so far right that's correct yeah uh-huh boy pressure luck has been thrown around i feel like i might have to pick it but there's a one in my head that is oh, see this is where I'm getting confused on whether I should go old school or new school we're about out of the big classics but I'm going to stick with old school and go a different place and say Hollywood Squares number nine son of a bitch oh, number nine on you son of a bitch not bad yes. tall hey we still got press your luck <laughs> it's probably seven and <laughs> we've all said it like three times <laughs> you know, it's I'm funny just because gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. It's funny because it is on the list somewhere. I'll tell you that it's in the top twenty. Yeah. Okay. And you have you motherfuckers have said it three times, and I've literally written it down next to your name. Like, like, come on, this time for real, no whammy. I I have to say, I, I mean, at this point, my choice has to be press your luck because. No whammies, no whammies, come on, big money. It's just like a fucking thing that I fucking love to say all the time anyway, so come on. Pressure luck. Number 11 on the list. You got it, baby. Not bad. Yeah, we're doing pretty good here. (sighs) Yeah, God, getting down there. Okay, we're moving on to the final round here. Last pick. Uh, I want to tell you the the strangest place I've ever done, Whoopi, Chris. Uh Uh, Uh-huh. Oh, shit. Bob. That'd be the bud, Bob. The uh-huh. newlywed game. Good one. Yeah. The newlywed game is number 13 on the list. Mm, I'm surprised. Still we still points, haven't huh? knocked off. Still hitting yet. points, baby. Yeah, still getting points. Whew, man. No <laughs> that game was pretty popular. Um, The dating game? Hmm. The dating game. That's not a good game. sign. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just just outside of a scoring position at twenty two. Sorry, buddy. Hey, that's that's still pretty good. I mean, you yeah. guys have done really well here. Yeah. To be fair, I think I so, might uh, I might know what the what six is now. Yeah. Oh, too late though. Uh, <laughs> it is too late. John Mark's John got Mark. a chance. Pull it on. Huh? I'm gonna go with. Um, I was thinking this show might have been called The Dating Game, but it's actually called The Love Connection with Chuck Woolery, so I'm going to go with that one. Oh, yeah. Well, Chuck Wool, he's been saying some crazy shit lately. Sure has. It seems like the older some folk get, Mm -hmm. the crazier this shit they say. 
It is on the list, but it's pretty far down at number 32. He was the two and two guy. We'll, we'll see yeah, you. Yeah, we'll be two back in two and two. Yeah, I love. <laughs> I oh, lo- yeah, I love connection. That shit was, that, that shit was it's funny. funny. It didn't register to me until it's the exact same premise. Uh, Pretty much, the yeah. match game, dating game, uh, or not the match game, but the dating game. Uh, I think the dating game. One of those had uh, Richard Ramirez, the night. Uh, what was it? Yeah, the night, not night crawler, the night stalker. Right? Yeah, <laughs> was night, it, night what, maybe it wasn't the night. It was one of those serial killers was like straight up on one of those dating games. Um, well, fuck. Where are we at then? What's number yeah, six? Uh, okay. I was going to go I'll with go Let's through, Make a Deal. I'll go through uh, the top 25 with you. How's that? Real fast. We'll just blaze through them. Perfect. At 25, Double Dare, motherfuckers. I love that oh, game. Wow, double, double Dare. dare yeah. Didn't even think Perfect. about Younger, younger audiences. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, remote controls on there somewhere. Let's see, let's see. I don't, I don't have them memorized here. Uh, Twenty-four, Tic Tac Doe. I don't know mm-hmm. this game. Oh, that's the one that had. Isn't that the one that had the devil? <laughs> oh no, that was Joker's Wild, I think. Oh, one of those uh, had the. Oh no, the Tic Tac Doe had the dragon. Maybe you'd be like, I'll take X right to block or whatever. It was kind of like. I don't remember. I'm confusing a couple games, but there was a dragen. It was a uh, tick or a uh... puff. The, the magic the one dragon? that had the devil. We used to talk about Joker's <laughs> Wild. It was like Joker, Seven of Hearts, the devil. <laughs> it's amazing. Oh. It's Satan on their game show in the fucking seventies. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Okay, uh, where were we at? Oh, at twenty three. Whose line is it anyway? I didn't know no, it was a really oh, game show. It's not really yeah. a game show. Huh. Yeah. Okay. I don't. I don't. I don't know why that's on there. <laughs> it didn't make the top twenty, so who cares? Yeah. At twenty-two, the dating game, which I think somebody guessed. Mm. Uh, at twenty-one, Joker's Wild, which we were just talking about there. <laughs> the at devil. twenty. <laughs> at twenty, to tell the truth, I don't recall this one. I vaguely mm. remember it. Uh, at nineteen, the Gong Show. Oh sure, is that a game That's... show? Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was a game well, show. Yeah, yeah I, I guess, guess it was kind of a kind prototype of. between game shows and reality shows. Like it, it was a talent competition. It's more like a talent show, kind of, right? Yeah, but, yeah, whatever. But we didn't have those. We didn't have like American Idol and America's Got Talent and that shit back then. So I guess they were. Hey, have any of you guys seen the Gong Show with Mike Myers? No. <laughs> There's a new You've gong, been gong show, baby. Mike Myers, oh. Mike Myers <laughs> gong is playing a character as the host of a new gong show. I have to see. I need to look for that. Did you guys ever see that movie that implied that that host was like a secret spy or CIA agent or something? I never saw it. What was it called? It looked amazing. I can't I, remember. I, I feel like I might have seen it, but I don't know. I'll have to look that up. That sounds yeah, rad. Look it up. I'll look it up while Chris is going through some of the answers here. Uh, at 17, oh, excuse me, 18, The Weakest Link was popular for a spell. Oh, right. You are. Though that, was, that was a good Hi. show. That was a fun uh, show. At 17, Goodbye. Wipeout. I never really got into that, but I think it looked pretty fun. <laughs> I remember yeah, that Wipeout, one. yeah. <laughs> this yeah. all reminded me of my – Every I've realized lately that uh, so many elements of my life – uh, they're connected to who I was with at the time. <laughs> That's one thing. I have a very a different life than my parents. He's like, they've been together since the seventies. So they don't have that. But I was like, Oh yeah, I was with so-and-so at that point. Weird. Uh, da- by the way, confessions of a dangerous mind is the, uh, most people mm. think it's just a fictionalized story, but there's a, <laughs> there seems to be enough, I guess, to hang on to that. It's possible. Wait. Was that the one with the Coolio song? Uh, no, that was Dangerous Minds. This been to most our lives. Confessing to a I've, dangerous mind. Who was in that movie? Was I think George Sam Brown? Rockwell played uh, Rockwell? Chuck Barris, right? I feel like I've seen that, but I might be mixing that up with A Beautiful Mind. Oh my God! We are there's so oh, many. There's so, this is uh, this is tailor made for one of those owl, uh, weird owl, like no, polka on forty five where he does medleys. What I need is a Venn diagram of all three of these things <laughs> really connecting for me. Some listener do that out there. We'll give you some sort of prize. I promise. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, at sixteen, a show I, I'm not familiar with called Card Sharks, starring Joe McHale. Oh yeah. Yeah, I vaguely remember, I remember that. that. That was good. Yeah, Card Sharks. At fifteen, name that tune. 
Okay. Oh, classic. At I 14. could name that tune in three yeah. notes. I did name that name meow. That it's funny meow, that that never yeah. even occurred to me. Uh, at 14, are you smarter than a fifth grader? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. At 13, the newlywed game. I think somebody might so, have said that so one. So good. Loud day. So good. Mm. At, at 12, deal or no deal? Mm. Mm. Wouldn't have got me points, would it have? Uh, 12? Mm-hmm. At 11, press your luck. Yes. Mm. Oh, yeah. no at 10, password. Password. Oh, That's yeah. right. That was, uh, that was a lot like $25,000 yes. pyramid. So many game shows. Fucking hell. I love game uh, shows. I miss the game show network like it was in the 90s. I don't think it even exists now, but. At nine, Hollywood Squares. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Most of these were got. We'll go, we'll go through until we get to six here. Eight was Pyramid. Seven was Let's Make a Deal. Uh, six was The Match Game. The Match Game. I even said it, but not. Uh, I, I, I compared it to the one that I chose, which was The Dating Game. Wait, uh, which was, was the one that Chuck Woolery was on? Love I Connection. Oh. Love. He was on actually a few. It wasn't the match game. It was Love Connection. Love Connection. Yeah. Wow. Well, so I, don't, I don't know who hosted the match game, but he definitely hosted yeah. Love Connection, and he also hosted a a very underrated '80s game show, Scrabble. Look it up. It was re- very clever <laughs> how they made Scrabble Google into that a plunger movie. You basically had a whole bunch of, you had a letter that you had to, it's hard to describe. <laughs> it's really, uh, I loved it. You can see some episodes on YouTube. Anywho, wow, interesting list. And I'm glad that yeah. only one of them was new school. And I think that's the one to be new school. And uh, yeah, R.I.P. Regis Philbin. <laughs> Philbin or Philman? Philbin. Philbin. Philbin, yeah. Phil. Philbin. I always liked him. R.I.P. Game I always thought he was, uh, he was good at that job. You know, uh, Amanda, who was on this show at one point, was on America's, uh, or uh, who wants to be Jeopardy. a millionaire. Well, she was on Jeopardy, too. But mm. that was when uh-huh. Cedric the Entertainer was hosting it. So it's it's had a few hosts. But I think even though it's had, at this point, at least three, maybe even five hosts, we're always going to associate that show with Regis, right? I think he's yeah, great, sure. great at it. You do you guys have you guys watched any of the prices right with Drew Carey at all? I uh, only, no. I only watched the one that they made the documentary about where the guy Oh, it's another it's one where he good. gamed the system. It, it, it's pretty it's pretty good. I mean Bob Barker is a classic, but Drew, Drew Carey's pretty good uh yeah. pretty good host for that show. Do they still well, use the that. same old props and anyway. machines and stuff? Um, I you know I haven't seen it in a while, but they have like all a lot of the sim, a lot of the same or similar games. It's it's very it's super. I mean, like if you watch it, you're like, oh yeah, this is Price is Right, you know. They brought back. Uh, well, they didn't bring it back. Well, they're apparently going to bring back Supermarket Sweep, but they just put on mm. Netflix all the classic episodes or a bunch of classic episodes anyway. <laughs> that, speaking of games, that show's great, of but it makes shows, me so exhausted to watch because they're just constantly running. Have you guys? Have any of you guys watched The Floor Is Lava? No, is it good? <laughs> no. You you should check it out. Um, all right, all right. Uh, you should check it out because it, it's really <laughs> it's, it's it's really it's like it, it, it's it's kind of interesting how they do it, and it it, it looks kind of crazy. Like, you know, you would think that, you know, like, Oh, that looks like it wouldn't be too bad. But then you think about the physics involved and like the jumps that people are making and try not to, you know what I mean? And it's like, eh, I don't know if I can do that actually. Mm-hmm. But, um, I heard, uh, I can't remember who it was. Somebody was saying floor is lava, turn the sound off, put on some tunes, do whatever you got to do to get in the mood and then just watch it and just like have that, you know what I mean? And just watch it with the sound. Well, that's how I felt like, about uh, or whatever. the ninja ones. What was it? The, mm, yeah. Like American, American ninja, ninja. Yeah. And stuff like ninja world, ultimate ninja, ninja warrior yeah, or whatever. whatever those yeah. are. Good yeah. shit. Well, but it's, okay. it's, it's, it's fucking, it's, it's really fucking crazy. It's a, you should do it. I'll just check it at out. least one episode. I'm in the mood for game shows right now. Mostly classic. <laughs> I want them all to be available. I want to see all the old prices, right? I like seeing all the old products, uh, all the old models, all the old sets. You know, I love that shit. You know that you, now you got a decent computer. They, uh, have a Jeopardy game on Steam. Mm. It's a game. And it's just they like, just, they just added, yeah. Oh, that's, that's good to know. I'll check that out. It's That'd be fun to play with. Uh, well, your computer's handle it. Can so. you play? What I want is something like where 
it's looking more and more like we are really not going back to real life until probably this time next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hate even saying those words, but it's looking that way. Not necessarily even to do with the virus so much as the powers that be concerning where things, how things are being addressed. And it just seems like no one, anyway. So I'm looking into more and more ways of getting connected to the fam. And we used to all play Scrabble on the iPhone app, but they just ruined it. And it's how they ruined it. Bought out by a different company. Uh, I play Words of Friends. Yeah, well, that's where uh, Sarah and I just downloaded it, and I guess that's I avoided. I hated words. I hated the idea of Words with Friends on so many levels. One, they fucking stole it from Scrabble. (laughs) It's totally Scrabble. Yeah. Uh, On principle, that bothered me, but uh, apparently Scrabble's not too worried about there. What we got going on there? Just making a tinkle. (laughs) Somebody somebody didn't take that pee break that I called about a half hour ago, did Mm -hmm. you? Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of good family games that roughly are like four to six to eight people you could play online that are pretty good, like uh, Gang. God, what is it called? Gang something or other. But here's what I need. I need something that I, I, I don't mind me having to have the software or buying the thing. I need something that my family can just click a link on and join. <laughs> that's you should try that's my problem. Box. They're not going to download Steam and set up an account and you know you know what I mean like I'm I'm so looking you for need some... like you need a web browser game. Yeah. Like I I think you're right. Um uh, got to be out there. I found one that was Wheel of Fortune that was fun, but it it only plays two people. If you get Jackbox yeah. Party and you install it on your game, what you could do is you could text codes and they could just or they could just play on their computers. And you host. It's pretty cool. Hmm. Uh, Lyle's not wrong. This is something that we really need to do. I think it'd be a great interactive thing for the... I have five chapters of Jackbox on my Xbox, and any time I have friends over, all we do is fucking play. It's so much fun, and it has a web browser interface. It's really, really cool. We just need to figure out how to... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. We just need to figure out how to stream it properly because... It needs to not be laggy. Like if if Lyle's streaming it from his PC, I can't have 10 seconds between when they announce the question and when I see it on my end. And that's the problem I have when I stream it. I was trying to get it to work. And I know friends have done this successfully, so I know it's possible. I just don't know how to do it. What were you streaming it on? The Xbox. Well, there's – I don't know if the Xbox has delayed. Where were you streaming on Twitch? I was on Mixer and Twitch. Both of them soaked. Well, both of them have like a 16 second delay. Some of them do. You can set it where it doesn't have it. I, d- I couldn't find that setting. But that's neither here nor there. There's something we should talk about off, yeah, off, totally. off site. All right, let's move on here. Let's see how you guys did. <coughs> Excuse me. John Mark, so are you there? I... He said he was muted. Didn't know if he was muted or not. Yeah, that's what I saw. Determine when you're muted. No, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> I was just saying, it's, it's hard to tell when you're muted or not. When okay. you are muted. Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, I muted myself. <laughs> I got you. When you, oh, so when you, you think weighing, you're yeah. muted, is what I'm saying. <laughs> right. Hint, hint. Oh, John Mark. <laughs> so is that what we thought it was? That noise? Maybe. <laughs> Do I have permission <laughs> to leave it in? Because it's funny. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, whatever, dude. It was like a strong stream. John We've Mark. shared more. Okay, let's see. So uh, John Mark got number four, number seven, number eleven, and then whiffed for a total of thirty-eight points. Man. Monster got number one, number five, number nine, and whiffed on the fourth, getting him a total of 46 points. Oh, shit. Dang. Lyle got number two, number three, number eight, and number 13 for 54 points. So, Lyle, you're currently in the lead, but there is is a little round, a bonus round here. It's going to be like it's a final Jeopardy of sorts. So what I need you guys to do is open up your phone and send me a, a, a one, just a one-person text. Oh, wow, that came out wonky. <laughs> send a text right to me, not in the group. Okay. <laughs> a one-person text, they call it back in the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what I want you to do is wager how many points you feel confident that you can wager. Uh, the question, I'll give you a clue here, is about the all-time most – Winnings by a game show contestant. Send me your texts. Yikes. <laughs> uh, I'm at a one and threw it away. <laughs> Lyle, Lyle bet like 
six times the points he had. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, did I have... well, well, I uh, hope he loses. Oh, my how bad. many? How many points do you uh, want to wager of that fifty-four? <laughs> Convulse it six okay, times. Okay. I was like, holy <laughs> shit, going in the the <laughs> juice is on. I'm going to put him in his slave I fucking know it. I know it. I feel lucky. <laughs> Got that game show fever. <laughs> rest. Uh, let's see. Uh, John Mark. Okay, thank you. Perfect. All right, we have our wagers. Here is our question. Ken Jennings holds the record for the longest winning streak on Jeopardy. But it's Brad Rutter who has the most money he has won. Uh, he uh, appeared in 38 uh, episodes of Jeopardy since 2000, racking up the show's highest total jackpot. This was as of uh, January this year, by the way. So I don't know if something has changed since then. Mm-hmm. How much money did he rack up in Jeopardy winnings? Okay. Send me another text. And it's going to be closest wins. We're not going to do um, prices Right rules. Oh, this is good. Oh, this is gonna be all right. This is gonna be interesting. Oh, okay. Well, not that interesting, but it's close. You guys were pretty close here. Um, Lyle went a little high at eighteen million. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ron Ron said six million, and John Mark said five million. No, oh, fuck. The correct answer <laughs> was five or four, six. Four point eight nine million. No. Four point eight nine. John Mark. Damn it. John Mark had wagered 30 points. How does he manage to do it every time? 68. <laughs> no matter what. He got 68 <laughs> points. Uh, yeah. Ronster wagered 46 points, puts him at zero. And Lyle wagered 30, putting him at 24. But a good game was played by all. Congratulations, John. Yeah, that was, that was a really good question. I don't know the Brad guy, but I know Ken, <laughs> and I know how much he won. Like, I thought for sure Ken had won five-something, but... It's a little yeah, less yeah. than that, but yeah. 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 Fun. Fun stuff. Yeah. I love game shows. That's good uh, mm. zoning out and pretend the world doesn't. Uh, game shows always have this vibe where it's just like, whatever's happening in this tiny world, it's always going to be okay, man. <laughs> you, by the you, way, you, you guys by the have way. all watched the most extreme elimination challenge, right? Mm-mm. Uh, the weight, yeah. The weight loss one. Mm-hmm. No, no. MXC. Oh, the most um, extreme. Oh, the, no, that's most extreme, extreme weight loss. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's uh, taken from, I think, two Japanese game shows, Takeshi's Castle and something else, and they put it together, and then they have, like, these uh, people do, like, these, like, kind of ribald and raunchy sort of, like, um, uh, dubs over it, and it's fucking amazing and hilarious, and it's, like, the best thing. You, It's probably, you can find it on YouTube, but MXC, or Most Extreme Elimination Challenge, it's amazing. Hmm. I've heard about it. It was on FX. Yep, yep. That's Fucking it. watch it. Will do. And uh, be- real quick before we get out of here, favorite game show host of all time? Alex Trebek for me. I just love him. Hmm. Good, yeah. He's great. Wow. Mm, I'm I, gonna have to go, Bob. Oh, yeah, Bob's oh. a classic. Price is wrong, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a to- it's a toss up for me with uh, Alex Trebek and, and Bob Barker, and I have to, I probably have to go with Bob Barker. Yeah, uh, Trebek, definitely classic, but you know who my favorite family feud host is? Is Steve Harvey. <laughs> He's uh, just yeah, his great responses at are that great. fucking job. And mm-hmm. so I think he might actually be my favorite. Bob Eubanks. Is in the running, though, because he was just a dirty... You know, the 70s was a different time. You had Bob Eubanks, Dirty Man. Um, the original family... I don't Actually, I don't know if he was the original one, but he was one of the more famous ones. Uh, God, why am I spacing on his name? Family Feud host. Richard Dawson. Oh, yeah. Or is He's it, dead, right? Is it, Did he die? Is it Richard He's Dawson? Dead, right? Or is that the famous... Evolution, <laughs> something uh, like know. that. Um, yeah, he I think died. you're thinking of Richard Dawk- or Dawkins. D- Dawkins, the a- atheist. Yeah, that's the yeah, name. not Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawson. <laughs> but it was so funny because we were watching him the other night, and he's just like, he's like, "How are you, my dear?" And like, full on kisses them on the lips, <laughs> and then just kisses every woman. It was amazing. What a different time. What a time to be a man, huh? Game shows, <laughs> leisure suits. Um, Smoking an airplane. away with being horrible human beings. <clears throat> Anywho, 
Let's get on out of here. Radar Station Art at gmail.com. Um, Christopher, did you have an email set up yet for your? <clears throat> now I'll get it to uh, by the next podcast. I'll have it for sure. And tune in to our Facebook page, either the Comet Magazine or How Bizarre Podcast, and uh, check out our new endeavor, Christopher and I doing little uh, tidbits for the uh, How Bizarre News Desk. It's fun stuff, and you get to see us and mock us and uh, watch videos or watch, uh, see the shit that we talk about all the time. Eventually, uh, the whole podcast will be a version of this. But uh, we're working our way there. Baby steps. Until next week, we'll be talking about 9-11. Have a good week. Hi, guys. Don't get eliminated. Don't get eliminated? (laughs) Eliminated. (laughs) Bye. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. Goodbye. (laughs) Goodbye. I think it's How can a man a fight a shark? <laughs>